better to look at the lens than the, the, puff than the screen. If you look in the screen, does it make you look like you're cross-eyed? It just makes you look like you're not looking at the camera, which you're not. I'm still getting used to that because my old one was on top. Hi, Mom. Say hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Zach came over to hang out, and uh, we've been talking about bark tanning, and he's watched some of my videos, and we've talked about bark tanning, and he's been bark tanning. He just jumped right in there and did it without anybody holding his hand. He's got tanning experience already with, uh, what, buckskin? You wanna, buckskin, What's yeah. your tanning background? Uh, mainly Briefly. deer, buckskin, and uh, a handful of furs. Mainly fur. Yeah, brain tan. Okay, well, that's where I started, too. Um, I learned brain tanning first, and then... I did it for intensively, like crazy intensely. I did it for money and eventually wrote a book. And then as soon as that book was out, I was like, done, <laughs> I'm over it. But before the book came out, I had already started to experiment a little bit with bark tanning. That's been my focus because I'm like real interested in it. It's a problem that it needs work and it has needed work for a long time it's for a long time just nobody did it you know there was like a few a few of my tanner friends that experimented and they all a lot of them did real similar things and we all made the same mistakes and now finally it's kind of it's gotten some momentum you know but that's how these things work zach brought the heights he's been working on and we're just going to look at them go over some of the questions that he had about finishing and anything that comes up and it seemed worth uh, recording. And if it's super boring and dumb, then you'll never see this. <laughs> this one. So this is unoiled, unconditioned. This is deer. It's um, just completely dry. Yeah, dry. So roadkill deer, limed. I didn't. I actually didn't do the uh, what's uh, baiting. Did you, did you the, just pull it straight out of the lime? Or? And I just kind of flushed it out. Or Repeatedly? It, yeah, about five five times. That's that's okay. And, fact, um, you can make fine all of that way. This is all right. This, you can tell, like, I don't know if that's, like, a little bit of the epidermis or something. Mm, that kind of looks like something that you may not have been able to prevent. It's hard yeah. to tell, though. I can't, I can't be sure. And, I mean, you definitely have some grain damage here. Mm-hmm. But that can be caused, well, it can be caused by using a tool that's not up, you know, that's too sharp. Using the tool too hard, um, having a rough beam surface, over liming, uh, weak, mm. like too weak of a lime so that eventually the it starts to decay and break down or just yeah, leaving it in way too long. You know, it has a preservative effect and it preserves the hide to an extent, but it's not like... It completely preserves it, so it's pretty common for people to over lime or have too weak a lime. Also, if other things, I'm not saying you did any of this, but I'm just saying all the reasons that could happen. Um, like if someone were to take a skin and kind of wad it up into the lime mm. and then just leave it and never stir it and never do anything, then parts of the skin may not even be affected much by the lime, and then those could decay a little bit. So there's all kinds of reasons that this could end up happening. And I think definitely with, you know, some of these things were from the roadkill. This one was not as big, and I realized on the flip side, scud, scudding a little, you know, trying to get every last little piece of membrane, especially on the backbone, I, I realized that I was actually kind of... Making it worse. Making it worse, yeah, and, and by that time I realized it, you know. Yeah, well if you have but, a smooth beam, the other thing is use a, a slightly sharper tool. And mm -hmm. when you're scraping, um, don't push straight ahead. I mean, do you, do you ever use a draw knife? Yeah. Okay, so you know that if you're using a draw knife or a plane or a spoke shave, if you just cock it slightly to the side, you get a whole different, like, easier slicing mm -hmm. action. Like it cuts easier and more of a slice as the tool goes diagonally. So. When people are doing it, you may not even be able to see it, but when you scrape, I would say more often than not, um, especially if you're dealing with anything tough, as you slide down, you move, move your hands from side to side and, and slightly across. And you can do that both 
if the tool is straight and going straight across the beam this way, you can just work mm. like that if with every scrape. And sometimes it's really, really subtle. So be careful. I mean, you don't want to go like that. Or you can kind of work the tool at a slight angle or do both. But think about that. That shearing action, it can get you more cut with less pressure. Do you have plans with this and what you want it to be like? Um, I don't have any plans for this. But, so, two questions with... Well, what you don't have a plan for what kind of leather you want it to be, um, for instance. Right, I mean, I would like something more pliable to, um, yeah, to wear, or okay. in a situation like having kind of like a flexible bag would be cool, but sturdy enough. So if I made it in a backpack, I'd want it to be yeah, a little bit structurally more tight. So it holds form, but if I, I don't right. know, maybe made it into, check it like shoes or something, you know? Well, most veg tan doesn't stretch very much, and that's a function of a couple of things. Um, the main one is that the skin fibers are actually locked together with little bridges. Mm. Um, that's how the tanning actually occurs, in a way, is that the, tan the tannins will make these little cross-link, it's called cross-linking bridges between the fibers and it will set it up. If I have a piece of brain tanned buckskin like this, because this is deer skin too, I mean look at mm -hmm. the difference obviously. Right. But this actually has a lot of literal stretch to it, you know. It not not just pliability, there's a difference between pliability and ability to actually stretch. So some of that is because the grain is, is taken off. A lot of it is because it's manually just just worked like crazy, you know, while it's drying and pulled and pulled and pulled. But the other part is it's not it's not cross-linked like that. So if I was going to make something out of this that I didn't want to stretch very much, like say moccasins or something, I would put it in a really strong tannin solution and just shock it. And it would actually kind of like... The buckskin. Yeah, it would shrink oh. and almost seize up a little bit. Now it's only going to do so much, mm -hmm. but that's one of the reasons. Mm. Um, but this is deer. That's bark tan deer skin. Okay. So you can feel what that looks like what that's like yeah, in terms exactly. of making something more pliable. And this also has some stretch to it. A little, but definitely less than buckskin. Mm -hmm. This one has a little bit less. You feel that. Oh yeah, and what's that? Deer. I mean, what's the uh, difference between the two? Is it? That's a good question. It could be the individual the deer. Age, it yeah. could be pre-treatment. So there's a, the old saying is, um, leather is made in the beam house and what that means the beam house was the place where all the pre pre tanning processes happen so that's where you flesh lime dehair de-lime baiting all that stuff uh, and you know the the meaning of the saying is that that stuff before you actually put it in the tan largely determines what kind of leather you can make so mm -hmm. you can take this hide and you can have any intention that you want. You know, you could try to make it exactly like this or exactly like that. You could try to make it completely stiff so it doesn't stretch at all and it's like flat and hard, but there's, it has limitations. Like you're working within a set of limitations that have to do with the, the specific animal and how the hide was treated before it went in the tan and then also what it was tanned and how long it was tanned and all that. But within that, there's quite a bit you can do, like feel that. Right. <laughs> now that's a deer skin too, but it was treated really differently. If I mean, and that's part of the art of tanning. Like how can every time I take like a given hide, like a deer hide, and make it turn out more like that or more like this? Right. And this you is know, that's tan the oak? art. That's the art of tanning right there. And this is still tan oak. I or? believe that's tan oak and or live oak. I'm pretty sure it was mm. tan oak. That was one of my earlier successful brain tans or fart tans wow. but this is just incredibly soft like you could almost make underwear out of this you know this may be a jacket but yeah and i was amazed too like s smelling freshly cured bark tan i mean it is it's leather you know it smells like leather you think about it, it comes from the tannins yeah the bark it's just kind of mind-blowing there's different ways you could treat this to get it to come out the way that you want right. if you want to make it super soft yeah it's like lots you know lots of light oils get it like really well conditioned 
and then you need to work it a lot as it um, like as over it dries. Staking it. You can use a stake. I really don't prefer that, honestly, but it it'll put more stretch on it. So it'll it, you may be able to get a little more stretch out of it if you wanted to do that. But I use this a lot. Oh, okay. So this is a. Uh, is that for the uh, the membrane side, or both? Well, it's both depending on what you're doing. So if you want this wrinkly elephant skin texture, mm -hmm. you fold the skin grain to grain like that, and then you use oh, this okay. to just work it. So oh, okay. it makes it really pliable because it's bending the fiber so hard right here. Like imagine what you have to do by hand to kind of do that is, is this, right. which is much more labor intensive and you can only work a small area at a time. Whereas this, especially if you make a longer one, you, know, you can really work the thing. And if you want the grain smooth like this, you just make sure that you always fold it the other way. Gotcha. Um, and there's there's a graining board. It's called a graining board. <clears throat> they might have a different name actually. The one the the other ones because graining, I think what they're referring to is making that texture. But uh, there's some that have cork. Mm. So they don't mess up or dent this side. And I haven't made one of those yet or used it. But the other thing you can do, like if you wanted to keep this real flat and not stretched out and not, because if you work these a lot, you start to get, you know, this effect where the edges are all stretched out and they're wavy and it's not flat anymore. So a real common way to work, like this is the way this was worked here. So if you want to keep the grain smooth, you roll it, you can roll it loosely this way and then work it like that. And you do that in all different directions. Mm. Or even just, just like this. But see that way the grain is always stretching and it's not crushing in on itself. Because as soon as you do it this way, you develop these wrinkles. Start to pucker. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's called bowling. So if you just, you can just sort of do anything like this and do it in all different directions. When you finish, it'll still be completely flat, like this, but you'll have the, the smooth grain. And this is? That's horse. Horse. It looks a lot thinner than cow. Yes, and it's, it's a coarser, softer fiber, too. So to to dry this, like I said I didn't oil this one, but laid it on plywood. This is the very first one I did. Tacked it, stretched it, dried, but then it developed like the grain, you know, patterns of the, the plywood. Wood. Yeah. Does that then can you oil and work that out or is that something then you're kinda of stuck with? Yeah, um, so you, it depends on what you do with it. I usually don't tack them out. Um, I'll usually use oil and mm. paste them to a board. Mm -hmm. And I learned that from the Muir McDonald tannery in Oregon before they closed. It was like a traditional bark tannery. So it involves putting a pretty heavy oil on the grain side and kind of an excess of it. And then oiling this side as well. And then you take a tool called a slicker. Have you seen a slicker before? Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's just like a smooth slate or something like that. And you use that to slick the thing out onto a smooth surface. So with a cowhide or a horse hide or something like that, it's thick enough that you won't see the grain come through. And okay. on the flesh side, it kind of doesn't really matter. I just use a smoother surface. Like I have a big sheet of heavy plastic. It was actually like part of one of those bathroom stalls, oh, you know, oh, like yeah. like in, like a institutional bathroom stall. Right. But it's smooth, so it gives me this big surface I can paste onto. And believe it or not, that's enough to keep it pretty flat. Like it'll, you know, it'll kind of shrink in a little bit, mm. but it's also important always to dry leather slow, unless you're going to redo it. And of course, you can totally redo it anytime. So even after it's oiled, you can you redo that whole process and, um, you know, damp it back. Plus, if you're going to do anything with it, then, um, you know, in terms of like working it or conditioning it or making the leather softer or, or whatever, then you have to get it wet again anyway. So maybe like a damp cloth, wiping it down, making sure it's kind of absorbed the water, and then 
Depends on what oil. you're going to do with it. If I was going to re-stretch the whole thing like that, I would just soak it. Okay. Yeah, soak it, run it on the beam once on the flush side and just push all the water out, mm -hmm. you know, push all the water out. And then, yeah, start from, from there. Okay. But, you know, the type of oil you use, like if you want it to be really soft, you should use a fat liquor. You know, use egg yolks and olive oil or something like neat that. Neatfoot's oil? Would that yeah, neat's foot. Usually that's a compound. If it says neat's foot oil compound, it's actually like a solvent mm. uh, thin neat's foot oil. And so, say if I used egg yolk on this to make it super soft, I would just blend up the yolk itself and just rough paste it in there. Yeah, and I would usually use out. a combination of egg yolk and I use olive oil because mm. it's cheap and it works well. Oh, okay. And it's always available. So, yeah, I mean, the, that's a whole conversation. We could talk about that for another 20 minutes, but well, this think about that. So if you if you wanted this to be more like a, something flat and a little more dense and less stretchy and less broken in, you would also probably want to use a heavier oil. So like rendered goat, you probably rendered goat fat. I've been using uh, sheep tallow. Sheep tallow is fine too. Mm -hmm. um, deer, something like that. And you could cut that partially with um, a lighter oil like olive oil that's called dubbin if it's like you know 50 50 one of those heavy tallows with a light oil but if you use heavy oils like that and by heavy i mean it stays uh solid at room temperature mm -hmm. you will see a difference in the texture of the skin let me um run and grab a goat hide jesus Okay, so here's exactly what, let me just tell you exactly what I would do. So if this came out of the pan and I wanted to make it like this, I would put it out this way, again, on that smooth surface, take this tool, which is stainless, and it's not sharp, but it does come to kind of enough of an edge that there's friction, and it's like grabs the skin, and use that to stretch the skin back out because... Even if you put it on the beam, like the tanning process slowly shrinks it and you want to kind of get it opened back out. Mm. So this removes water and it gets it all smoothed out and you try to get it as flat as possible because it's going to have all these wavy edges and stuff. Then um, dubbin or even just tallow on this side, completely covered, flip it over on smooth surface, oil this side with whatever it's going to be oiled with, and then use the slicker so this is completely smooth and it's used to both stretch it out flatten it out because again it's going to have these wavy edges and you just keep working and working it to try to get it as flat as possible but this also takes out all of those marks so mm -hmm. any marks that were left from your beam all the marks that you have on here these wrinkles mm -hmm. all that stuff you can take out with the slicker and you try to leave it you know dead smooth when you're finished by just kind of like gently working it out and then dry it slow but not too slow because it'll mold which, which you, you i got an example out. of that yeah and this is a funny question but i did this with the goat hide here this yeah. is the first one i did with the dubbing where i had half olive oil and half tallow and um but being different consistencies one being solid and one being liquid then i kind of heated them enough to right mix them oh yeah you have to do and that. then uh, but then just using a rag i guess and the same thing I, i'm for a slicker i used i took a little piece of one by square that fit my hand rounded it enough with it with the edge you know hey, but remind rounded. me i can give you a piece of slate oh sweet and then trying to get this out and this is an old that old buck that old goat that i had died i was telling you okay. about and one thing is, so I got it relatively it looks like flat, you have right? And that was from the plywood. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that right? was from well, you. I mean, if you invested, right. wanted to invest in, you can buy finished, you know, finished plywood. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't get too wet, it probably just stays smooth. One of the things that I did differently with this one is because of that, that pissed me off so much. Is I would set the nails in, and then I would go around and I'd lift up the hide right. about an inch, and so then it. You know, it didn't have any marks with the, you know, the tallow kind of is left in there. And that, is that something that just with... Yeah, what you're seeing up? is, um, let me see, this effect right here. Right. And I had another hide I could have 
brought out. You can see it here as well. Yeah. Sometimes that'll actually be really thick. And I'm pretty sure what that is is stearic acid. It's some fraction, you know, the oil kind of fractionates naturally because um, any natural oil or animal fat or anything is not just one fatty acid, right? I mean, it contains all these different fatty acids. So even this highly saturated tallow contains some light oils and some heavy oils. So the heavy oils will like end up kind of separating and depositing on the surface mm. and more become more and more solid. So like the stearic acid, I think, is the most saturated. That's that like super waxy fat that's around the heart. Have you ever eaten heart and yeah. it has just super waxy fat? That's stearic acid. It's almost like wax, like it'll cool in your mouth and solidify and stick to your mouth. Yeah. You can dip, uh, that's why you can dip candles out of tallow is because of the stearic acid, I'm pretty sure. So I think that's what this is. And if you just take um, a soft cloth and maybe heat it a little and just really rub it in there yeah. and get down into those uh, cracks. There's like a couple of spots out. here, there. That's exactly what I did is kind of yeah. had a, you know, warmed it up and then really worked it even like with my fingertips and got it in there it, it looks to me it looks slightly over oiled but yeah it's kind of hard to tell really. in these spots it looked like i might have tested it with which is straight olive oil after the fact which darkened it up more yeah these maybe these are hyper saturated or something yeah yeah that's a common mistake is over oiling it's um you don't want to just keep adding oil and keep soaking it up, you know, you don't need so much. The trick is more to get an even distribution, which is difficult, especially on something like this, you know. It's like, how do you do that? Well, in a factory, they put it in a big tumbler with, um, you know, warm oil, and they drizzle the oil in as all the hides are tumbling around and, like, dry. You can hold it in front of the fire, mm. you put it in the sun, but it's hard to get even penetration. But it shouldn't be too hard well, with something like this. Well, that, that's, I think what I had issue with is dipping it, say I had like a rag, dipping that into the oil mixture. And then once I hit, it seemed like immediately it soaked up and then I, you know, it's getting focused. And then as I'm rubbing it around, it's kind of like those are spots of oversaturation versus like And was trying this to... wet? Yeah. Yeah, if it's real wet, you shouldn't get too much soaking in immediately. So just go over it and then you could kind of wipe off the excess or something okay. like that. Yeah. And then as it dries, the water leaves, the oil can move in. This was this was a goat that was about 3 days rotten. I actually gave up on it. It was turning you know bluish green yeah. i threw it in the compost pile and i was like i'm done with it and the next day we had talked about that and i was like might as well try it yeah so it. my story is the very first bark tan i did i had this hide that was so gross yeah. and so smelly and so rotten it was just beyond like I, I, I remember it very well. I think it was a piece of elk hide and, or a real thick deer. I still have it too. I don't even know why I was messing with it. It was so bad. I mean, it smelled like an open septic system. Or something. Yeah, really definitely. dangerous. It's very dangerous to handle hides like that. Yeah. And I remember like flushing it. It was like separated into layers. So there was kind of like the one side and the other side and it was a sandwich. And in between it was like all cottage cheese like. But there were like broken open ulcers that would like reveal this cheesy crap inside there. <laughs> And I just happened to have some oak bark, some tan oak bark from my neighbor who's a firewood cutter. And he, we could just go pick it up. You know, oh, I was yeah. like, I'm going to try bark tanning. So I chopped some up. I threw the thing in there, like really, really strong solution. And then, you know, a month later or weeks later, I pulled it out. And it, it actually kind of reconsolidated. Like you couldn't really tell any of that stuff about it anymore. Mm. And it just, it's almost like it just fixed the hide because... The tannins went in there, like I said, and they like bound all the stuff back together and locked yeah. it together. Not only did I still have that, I used it as a napping pad, so, you know, flint napping. So I'd have it on my mm. lap for hours on end, breaking, you know, obsidian, like gra glass sharp obsidian, just all over it, just heavy, heavy wear like that. I left it hanging in a tree for a year, like, like just like this, exactly like this, a tan oak tree, like outside in my yard for a year, and I still have it. You know, <laughs> yeah. 
It's amazing. It's amazing, yeah. the preservative power. And I also, the other thing I do is I always throw my pieces of bark pan in the compost, like scraps and stuff when I'm done. And every time I sift the compost, I see the same pieces come out and then I throw them back in. And I've been meaning to mark some of them with like dates to oh, like yeah. follow the progress for years, but I'm sure some of them are like five years old. Eventually they start to go, but it really is incredible what they can go through. So, yeah, so I don't recommend that though. Handling hides like that is, is really dangerous. I know lots of people that have had gross. infections. Yeah. You know, everyone's like, oh, I don't get infections or I need this and that. Then they get one and they're like, oh yeah, I had to go to the hospital with blood poisoning. <laughs> this will have a story. All right, what else you got? This is deer with the grain off. But not tan oak? This is tan oak. Oh, it's a really nice it's, it's fawn not, color. Yeah, it's not oiled. Yeah. Same with this is a young uh, year old goat grain off. Um, same thing unoiled. But yeah, it's, well, yeah, a fun thing to do with these might be to do a fat liquor. Like I said, you can use brains if you want, but mm. I would add a little bit of oil to either one. Brains or egg yolks, you know, dip them in there warm and then hang it up and let, let that stuff dry into it. Yeah. And then you can do that again if you want. Um, the other thing with bark tan, depending on how much you want to stretch it and how much you want to work it, is you can damp back. So you can take uh, towels, soak them in water, and then wring them super, super hard. Like get all the water you can out so there's no, like, they're not soggy at all. Lay one out, lay the hide on it, lay another one, roll mm. it up, put it in a, you know, wrap it in another cloth or put it in a plastic bag or something overnight. And it'll just get an even, a relatively even redistribution of moisture. And then you can work it and you don't have to wait as long for it to dry. Do the dampening, oil it, work it. Oil it first. Oil like it first. do the whole fat liquoring thing. Maybe let it, oh, right. like I said, let it dry in once. Because the, the thing about fat liquoring is like I was saying, you you know you take this and you have your oil and you put it on both sides well you know so what it still has to like slowly creep you know it's oil it has to slowly creep and seep down in along the fibers and you hope it gets in there you hope it distributes itself evenly eventually but with a fat liquor it's an emulsion so you have hmm. water which is easily moves through the hide and you have the emulsifier, which is the lecithin and the eggs, egg yolks or whatever, or you you can use brains. And then you have the oil droplet that attaches to the emulsifier, which is loose in the water. So now we have oil droplets being carried through the hide evenly and distributed completely through the hide. Oils and the conditioners and the egg yolk themselves, you know, obviously have an effect too. So it's not just the, that you're carrying oil in. But yeah, I mean, that might be a fun thing to do with these and then just break them super soft, almost like uh, brain tan or something, okay. except you'll find that they won't, they won't stretch the same way. And will they want to kind of pucker and take that an animal shape? Yes. Again? Um, it looks like you have a lot of the edges are gone though. Mm -hmm. But if you want to prevent that, instead of using stakes and cables. So if I take this and I run it over a stake, by anyone who doesn't know that a stake is like a, a stationary blade, it's like a dull, usually a dull blade, and you pull the hide over the edge of it, and the purpose being to bend the fibers of the hide, which softens the skin. It's similar to taking this and rolling it like that, or you know, the thing I was using. So if you want to maintain the flatness, don't do things like that that actually stretch it. Don't pull it, you know, don't run it over a staker, don't run it over a cable, just do this stuff. You know, by hand you can do it like that. Mm -hmm. You can use the graining board to roll it. Um, you can do the bowling, like I said, like this, and just, um, this gets like, you know, bunches of the sections of the hide all at once and do that in different directions and then you can keep it more flat. And I was thinking this could be like potential experiments for like little notebook book binding, you know, covers. Mm -hmm. Some strong but flexible. Yeah, the thing about deer high is it naturally wants to be a little bit more flexible and stretchy. 
I don't know how it would perform in the long run. Goat is definitely a better choice. This that. is and this is the little goat scrap. Oh, that's a goat. It's a little okay. thin, yeah. yeah. This one this feels a like deer. a tool belt, like what it could be this for like is a, a tool deer. belt. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Grain off on those. Yeah, for for a book cover, goat actually is a really traditional book binding leather. Mm. I, I love that. And that's why. Cause it color. It has this flat. Like you try to take that goat hide or any goat hide and make it like this, mm -hmm. you know, this really pliable, it's tough. Like it has to start before tanning starts. Mm. And I don't even know, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's possible to the same extent. Squirrels. <laughs> Did you ever read DeLon at all? No. Um, in there he talks about this Moroccan goat processing and it's just insane the number of steps they go through to try to get this leather broken down so. just step after step it's like you know step on it for an hour here and oh in the pits too right yeah it's... working it in pits all these different steps i was just flabbergasted so what's this these are squirrel that's these... a pretty thick squirrel squirrel that... is really nice skin oh that's thick this one both conditioned with uh tallow that's what i had and this one came out super thick and clean. Of course, there's still some like epidermis and little of the summer hair that I could just could not get off. Uh -huh. I mean, I even tried on the legs, and and that's what maybe you know rips some edges, stuff a little weaker. But this one came out super, super smooth. Of course, I like to clean it up a little bit. This one, I don't know, it's just filthy looking, but it is way more pliable, thinner. Yeah, it's definitely a lot thinner. This so, one's just exceptionally thick for a squirrel. Yeah. Although they often, those four squirrels can be pretty thick. Yeah. It's just really nice skin. My friend Talkin's yeah. always saying, you know Talkin now on Instagram, right? Uh, Necromancy Creations. Oh, yeah. She uh, she loves squirrel skin. <laughs> she's and she's out saying, of Ohio, too. Yeah, she's out of Ohio, too. Yeah, yeah this one, I was, I was super surprised. I got two more in the tanning solution now. I mean, what's the, you know, in terms of discoloration and things, what is the difference? I really have, to, I, I yeah. wouldn't be able to say on that. Who knows? It's funny how Anything that could have happened along the way. Like, it could have been exposed to some metal, like iron. Mm. One, Even a little bit in the water or just some, it's hard to say. There's one difference is this one um, I had dry scraped. I had the f fur on and I had dry scraped this one and kept this one with the raw hide um, with the membrane on and then threw this one in this is with the membrane still on oh okay. and so that's you know. way easier uh-huh yeah i definitely yeah do. i've migrated more more to flushing less and less with bark tan you know i yeah. just get the gooey gross easy stuff off um and whatever comes off easy while you're scudding because if you scud yeah. enough as a home tanner you should be scudding multiple times like four to six times really five or more times is, is kind of how i think of it that's I, that's one of my so a lot of it's going to come really off anyway. Enjoyable, yeah. Especially you're you're talking about the sideways motion. Yeah. I remember watching the videos, trying it, and then rewatching and seeing that, and how instead of fighting that membrane off, yeah, yeah. it was just like getting that yeah. front. But it's yeah, really subtle. Yeah, there's a lot of technique to scraping that needs to be a, one or more videos. Just on scraping. So what you got there? Pouches. Like <laughs> this one is. So this, I forget if this is the first stomach of, this was a, sh this was a sheep, and it's got the honeycomb shape on it, super thin, um, tan real pretty. Yeah, it looks over oiled. A little bit, yeah. This would that be a great place thing. for fat liquoring, you know, mm -hmm. put it in the fat liquor, and then just hang it up, and let it dry, and then, you know, re-soak it back in the warm fat liquor again. And good is that good way to get even distribution without too much saturation, right? Mm -hmm. And then as you're working it or as needed, um, just really lightly wipe maybe a little olive oil in. Because this is so thin mm -hmm. that you can just, you know, just like that, it's over oiled. And to you get know, it, it looks, you can see so how translucent it is and everything. Yeah. That's pretty impressively soft. It's This one turned out, yeah, really, really well. It is really thin. Sorry but now this that. is the other stomach the other main stomach this actually turned out really well different texture it's got the little lumps on it little skin tags 
But the inside... So this is a different stomach. This is the main stomach. Okay. And I just took a cut off of one of the oh, yeah. rounded edge. Little... Yeah, right. I've so this, I screen. feel like, is the first stomach. And then there's the big one. Yeah, I don't know. How um, it works. But this is the, actually the inside of the stomach. And this is the inside of the stomach. But this turned out really well. I got out of um, our ram that I did. I got a pouch about this big from the stomach and this yeah this turned out nice that's cool it's holding up so well i know yeah, i have one that i tanned uh, with the honeycomb stomach and i haven't mm. softened it so it's just this brittle and so when you go thing. through the emulsions and then you hang it to dry do it again and you don't then, have to do that i just think it it'll help you get a real even distribution and let the mm -hmm. let everything else settle in and then you can just again reheat the the emulsion and start it in there and then go to your whole softening thing and it, right, so that's kind of just like working it back and forth till it's, till it's dry. Yeah, or you could, um, and it's best always best to do that while it's damp, and then work it till it's dry, just like bark brain mm. can. You'll get you'll get better results, and it's easier. Um, <laughs> unless you damp back, you can start with it wet right out of the emulsion. You know, just wring it as well as you can, and then start right away. Or you could dry it and then damp it back, like I said. Oh, okay. You know, quit like something damp in here and then kind of wrap it and just let it sit for maybe 10 or 12 hours. Scroat totes. So that's a, a, that's a goat scroat? This is the our, <laughs> this is our ram. Holy sheep. crap. Yeah. That could be like a baby hat. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, this is definitely something I want to, you know, take out, you know, it could be anything I own. Well, this could be actually be a great kind of like a fire starting, you know, it's like a mitten. Kit. Yeah, I know. It's too big. <laughs> it's huge, yeah. And this is this is a, a young Man, year year sheet. And so this softened up really nice. Hmm. That's made me one of the most popular guys on my Instagram feed, you know, the scroat totes. <laughs> this right, one you were though, saying at the feed store. Feed store, the yeah. Guys, girls, they're all loving it. <laughs> um uh yeah, grocery stores, it's always nice to come out you know correct, uh, good conversation starter oh great yeah <laughs> yeah definitely um That's this funny. one is is thick. It seems pretty yeah pretty tough and yeah. it's like i have been talking about over oiling i mean i have just yeah don't try to rely on oil to get it softer it's not it's, yeah. that's not the problem at all in fact with this i would i would put this in warm water and soap and wash some of the oil out and then just kind of same thing, just keep rolling it multiple directions. and While it's drying. Yeah, that's, okay. That's the trick. It's just like brain tan. If the fibers aren't stretching and it's already dry, you, you just aren't going to get the same effect. But, you know, yeah. there's there may be a limit, too, to what right. you can And I don't mind achieve. it. This is still tough, but it's, it's, it's pretty thick. And, like, I just don't like that kind of popping sound. You know, I, I like yeah, it yeah. at the... At the top is nice. So. Yeah, well, you may or may not get it, but, you know, obviously mm -hmm. you probably do a lot of this, right? Uh-huh. So that's about the best thing you can do because it, it bends the fiber really, really hard. I also try to take it easy just because... The hair. One in the hair, yeah. Yeah, so. um, you might, maybe you could do it harder if you do it, um, you know, the other way mm -hmm. without damaging the hair. Yeah. But, yeah, I could see that really messing the hair up doing it that way. <laughs> yeah. But... Yeah, that's yeah. going to get you that. Well, yeah, and then, then it's hard because it's too slippery. Mm. So, yeah. But I could probably, if I had a great supply of... Scroats. Scroats. I could I could definitely make a good living on yeah. that. There's no big um, slaughterhouses around here. But, but you oh. can talk to a uh, mobile butcher. The mobile? You know, the mobile butchers. They just have, like, a truck, and they don't do the butchering. They just do the slaughtering. Mobile oh, right. slaughter. Right. Those guys, you know, because the thing is, they don't have to skin it, so they might not, you know, if you ask them to save hides, they always cut them if they're, if they're too big of a hurry. Now this. So you don't think this was like that before you dried it? No. This one, well, when I took it off the board, it was, this was like the morning of day three. Yeah, but there's no mold, so. But, no, it wasn't, it was, um, but when I took it off, mm -hmm. I felt that it was like, uh fresh mold on bread how it has that fuzz it almost felt oh. like that furry fuzz but it's i weird. think i rescued it really it. doesn't look 
moldy, so who knows? But yeah, I, I see what you mean. It feels a little different. And I don't. And it just feels greasy too. Almost. Or did you oil it? More? This is oiled just once with the tallow, and actually took. Huh, that's strange. Really well, it feels real different. Yeah. Like this is all dry, and this has this greasy, oily. And so that was what it was. This is the last thing to dry. It wasn't completely dry, and I had it in a room next to the wood burner and How's the next to it. Look side look. Yeah. So this so, is your big your big ram. Yeah. And so. This is good acre material. Yeah. Right. I know. And this is, and the neck on this was so thick. It has like these wrinkles. And I'm sure if I wanted to, and I know what you mean. I could have really tried to work it, but there's this lump here that... Yeah, I don't know what that's about, but uh, the way to deal with that would be from this side, you know, thin it from this side. Uh-oh, They use the, interesting. Uh, the traditional tool is a courier's knife. I don't, I don't know if you've seen that in any of my videos. I did one where I talked about the courier's knife. It's the rawhide axe handle wrap mm. guard thing video. But in that video, what I'd used instead was just a butcher knife and turn the edge like a cabinet scraper. Have you ever done that? No. So you just, um, I could teach you later or just learn about cabinet scrapers, but it's, you just take a, here, hand me your knife. Yeah. So if you were to get the knife really sharp, um, you just take like a, a hard rod or a smooth hard rod of some kind, like a, to burnish. Mm -hmm. And then you start at a slight angle and you push the edge over into a little hook. Mm. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like a burr, a sharpening burr, but it's in created intentionally out of the the edge. And what it does is it it forms this hook, and it allows this kind of like cutting, slicing action. But since it's hooked over, it can't go very deep, and so you can peel off, literally peel off like shavings of skin. Different than like like a ninety degree regular ninety mm. degree scraping. It's kind of like slicing, but it's control. The de has depth, its own self-limiting depth control. Um, anyway, that would be the way to thin this out if you wanted. But honestly, if you if you need that spot and you need it mm -hmm. to be thin, you'd want to get it from this side. With the skin skinny marks too, I always kind of talk shit when I get hides and I see all the skin by the neck and. Uh. Blah blah blah, and here I am. Like I yeah, was yeah. real tough with it, and I just ended up cutting them. But yeah, well, sometimes it just gets so hard at the neck, you just have to start cutting. And yeah. If you don't take like a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And this is still yet to I feel like dry, just fine. But and then also with you know this is just me um, wiping off the excess um, oil, and that's just the st streaks of a towel. If it's wet, you. The grain is just, you know, just touch it like that and yeah. leave a dent. There's one right there. That's probably a fingernail dent right there. But if it's wet, you know, anything you touch it with. And so to really get that out is... The slicker the on slicker, a smooth right. surface. And, okay, so I have, like I said, I was using that rounded one by to get it out and stretched. So maybe that's the la very last thing I do and then... Not to be able to lean You can into do it a lot, but just whenever you're done, stop doing this. Mm -hmm. Stop doing anything. Make sure the edges of your slicker are gently rounded up, and it's dead smooth. And then just, you'll just you'll be able to see every everything you leave. But if you lighten up, you you'll stop getting any marks on the edge like that, and you can just leave it all completely smooth. And, and will that will that come out then? It's dry. When uh, if I if you were to do like. Uh, a full-on softening some some of this stuff would probably just sort of bend its way out especially if you did the the inward softening to make this uh, crinkly grain texture oh yeah like kind that. of covered up then it'll just you know you won't you won't see it once that happens because the grain's going to go all stretched and that's and, and that's the um that doesn't work as well with goat by the way i find um, deer just wants to do this already goat wants to be smooth and sheep will be kind of like in between. I don't kinda, deal with sheep ever. Yeah, yeah sheep are. The, the skin isn't so that great. Yeah. I just, unless you're going to leave the fur on. Mm hmm. I mean, it has uses, but if you have access to goat and deer hides, I, I'm always going to end up tanning those. People offer me sheep. I'm just like, eh. Yeah, yeah. I'm if you leave the fur on, 
I mean, if right. you have the wall on, it's, they're amazing. Yeah. For some things. So this could be uh, a good candidate of that uh, woodworking apron. It seems like it. It's it's yeah. it's light. I mean, it's yeah, not. I mean, like I would try to make enough. it fairly soft, but I would use, like I said, don't don't do this to it. You keep it smooth mm -hmm. and do the rolling the other way, like haul it. Just stretch it. You know, just do this on the floor or something, and just roll it like mm -hmm. that while it's damp until it's dry. Mm -hmm. Not constantly, but just enough. You know. With the dampening, and then do I have to reapply any oil? It depends. Just do it as you need it. You mm -hmm. know, it depends on how much you got in here in the first place. And a lot of times with that, you just want to take, have a, an oily, you know, maybe olive oil rag, just but real light, you know, and just hit the grain once in a while if mm -hmm. you think it needs it. You could probably fat liquor this actually, and then do that and get it pretty pliable and soft, but it's not going to be like probably super stretchy, which is exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. you, know, you want it to be comfortable. You want everything to hold its shape, but um, you don't want it to be stretchy and floppy. What else you got? Your cool gun belt. Check that out, <laughs> dude. He found this in a thrift store. Three bucks. This cool gun belt. It's the real deal, too, you know. Fully used for three bucks. It, all, it looks kind of homemade. It looks like someone cut a belt off, doesn't it? Almost. Yeah. Yeah. It looks kind of... Homegrown. Ragged. And would that That's be cool. That's cattle? That's veg, veg tan for sure. Yeah, probably cattle. Because cattle doesn't stretch, you know. I mean, maybe horse, but horse hide is... Yeah, it's probably cattle. It ought to be almost for sure one of those two. Who knows, huh? Cool though. Some yeah. history behind that. That that's was on someone's waist a lot. <laughs> this was a cool video. Yeah, definitely. We could go on for hours and hours. And <laughs> yeah. hours. The new baby in the house for her chair, bark tan raccoon, softened up real nice, and now it sits in there. And I can't even describe the smell of that fur hmm. after being oiled and softened and dried, but just the smell of yeah, fresh bark tan. It's, yeah, I really can't explain how clean it is after really just being rinsed a couple times. And same with with this as well. How did that do? Did it uh, tint the hair much? No, not at all. Yeah, it often will. It's just, uh, it, it doesn't as much as you might think. But I had to run it in for maybe like three, three weeks or something. Mm -hmm. But I was working it probably every other I mean, it's it's more days. obvious, like with a, you know, squirrel has like mm -hmm. a lot of pretty, you know, pretty close to white fur, and you'll see it, you know, on that. But maybe with a raccoon, it just this, doesn't. Do this much. you can, kind of took a little tint mm -hmm. on the hair. Yeah. Plus, um, you know, different hairs are different too. So, uh, fur don't seem to have been bark tanned that much. So like they were often dressed rather than tanned or treated mm -hmm. with alum and and oil. Right different kinds of oil preparations. Snack. It was sweet. So after this dries, I'm gonna dampen it and work the shit out of it. Do I have to do that until it's then dry? Yeah. I mean... Like it's not gonna dry stiff if you don't finish up like rain can. Yeah, exactly. There's no rule. And mm -hmm. with bark tan, it doesn't it's not able to like just really glue down to itself like brain tans more like rawhide you know it wants to do that but this can't do that mm, okay. i mean it can to an extent obviously that's why you're working it but so like in terms of you know like a bag would be great i'd love to get into you know crafting leather work but this would be it's not super thick but to get it well you could shoot for something like this Mm. You, know, you may or may not get it that pliable, depending again on the nature of the particular skin and what it went through before. But I mean, this has a good combination of pliability, flatness, limited, you know, limited stretch. Obviously, this will have less stretch. So, you know. So, is it kind of to the point where 
you finish it, soften it in a way, and then you see what you would make from that after it's all said and done, because you'll be able to read the hide or... Exactly, like for yeah. us, you know, mm -hmm. we have a limited ability to control exactly what it turns out like. So sometimes that's kind of what you're going to end up doing. Mm -hmm. You can always shoot for it, and then, you know, as we learn more and more, we'll be able to do that more. Right. But, you know, there's so few bark tanners now that are at that level. So that was done. That was the same, you know, type of tan, type of skin, mm -hmm. bark tan, but rolled the other way. Oh, I see. Right. More puckery. Yeah, and you can see goat skins like this though. It just it's got this always has this papery thing going. Now I just love the color of what the tan oak will do to the goat. Mm -hmm. I mean the, the deer is nice as well, but if um, you were talking about doing the bowling on this, that's uh, the term I think is bowling. B o w l i n g bowling. Once once it's damped back. And it, it'll be more flexible and more pliable and you start getting it broken in you'll see you can kind of roll it up loosely and start really going for it and pushing hard and you can also use your forearms um, and then this tool is basically a forearm ex, you know augmentation device so this will have a, a peg handle here mm. this one I'm going to put cork on the face so that it won't dent right because this would be leaving all kinds of little pecker marks all over the and that's primarily used for the inside exactly because right. it has just some grip and and typically these are actually sharp ridges this is just one i whipped out you know the first that's the first one i've made so this will have cork and then this makes this like a whole forearm extension and there's a strap that holds <laughs> here yeah so with that cork face you'll be able to just like really lay into it and it's just it's just more efficient i mean you can obviously do all of that stuff by hand and that's a traditional tool yeah yeah there's there's three that i know of um there's the ridge ones and the ridges vary in number like you know how many ridges per inch but they're typically sharp and just for better grip and then there's the cork face and then there's one that's tin, tin face, like a grater. So like it's oh. tin with little holes punched in it. <clears throat> then obviously that would be also for, for this side, just to give it like really good grip. So I want to make all of those and do, you know, do some testing sometime.